So, I'm back. It's been about uh that long since I've last uploaded to YouTube. So, I've been gone for a little while, and that's partly because I've been very busy. Working two jobs, having a life, trying to grow physically, and so on and so forth. My shoulder and arm nearly just popped. That's not good. I might need to go to the hospital. I hope not. But in the meantime, I decided to uh, do some some improvement on myself, aside from that physical. Um, you can kind of see it. Uh, it, it it's kind of in, around. It's something to do with... Oh my goodness, when did that get there? I have a bookshelf now. That's a joke. I already had a bookshelf. I just moved it. But... In that time, I have not been uploading or streaming. I decided to do some reading. I have read a lot of books recently. And one of the books I read recently was this one. Between Two Fires by Christopher Buhlman. Took me a while to figure out how to say his last name. His last name is the easiest thing to say in this book. Oh my goodness, I can't stand Frank. It is... So difficult to say. I primarily listened to this book on Audible. Fantastic reading, by the way. I would highly recommend, if you have Audible, to listen to it. Guy does an amazing job. I'm blanking on the author's name right now, but I'll show it here. But if you don't have Audible, there is a way that you can listen to this as well. The author, Christopher Buhlman, has also uploaded the entire book to his channel on YouTube. He reads it. I have not listened to it, but I, well, I listened to some of it, but I haven't listened to all of it. But if you don't have the money to buy it or you don't have an Audible account, that's a great way. I would recommend the Audible, but that's just because that's just how I listen to it. But what was I saying? Oh, yeah. The guy says French words so easily, and I'm so confused when I go into the book and realize, oh, yeah, the word that... Pressy. It's spelled with a C. My goodness. Friends, what were you doing when you concocted your language? Between Two Fires is a fantastic read. It al allows you to be enveloped in a famished and disheveled French countryside devoured by the plague. Allows you to experience horror while not having to see Homelander decapitate the 14th person this week. It allows you to be engrossed in a story of redemption, of camaraderie, of demons, of angels. It is a story that has, in my opinion, the epitome example of so many things that I love about fantasy and medieval times. It has the grit, the grime, and the glamour that one expects from this type of story, and I fully embrace it for you to check out. I emphatically implore you to please read this or listen to this before watching the rest of this video. This video is going to spoil the entire story. I'm going to go through the major beats in most of the book in this video to discuss the themes and relevancies of, that I think are important to understand what I will eventually get to in about four and a half hours or maybe 20 minutes. Depends how much time I decide to take up on listing off everything that happens in said book. I have a notebook. I have the book with so many bookmarks in it. It looks like it's been through four world wars and also... Uh, some other notes that I took on my phone. But I want to preface this by saying if you're a fan of horror and medieval stories, this is a book for you. If you're a fan of horror, this probably isn't a book for you because the horror is fairly light and the horror is a lot more of a oh, what these poor, poor people and also 
it said in fr during the <laughs> Black Death, so it's not really the happiest place to be. Also, there's plenty of stuff that goes on in the story that is not per se pleasant or considered PC. But I'm not here for that. I'm here to tell you the story of Between Two Fires. Now, ultimately, the story and why I'm bringing it to you is because of the epic tale that it tells. Uh, it, it says it on the name, the, the book cover, uh, you know, they really wanted to get it across that was epic. But the ending, and specifically how it details some of my favorite themes in literature and media overall. But the story's main focus is about being redeemed of past evil, past sin. The story opens up on a war-torn France, Normandy, if you will. Uh, I honestly didn't realize Normandy was a part of France until I looked it up, and I'm still not sure, so if someone fact-checks this in the comments, uh, yeah, you're, you're fine. I didn't care enough. <laughs> no. I, I just did, was confused, and I spent like multiple hours researching other parts of this so this is a final warning before i spoil the majority of between two fires if i haven't sold you on to you yet i'm sorry i'm not really good with hooks that was one of my biggest issues in high school with writing essays i couldn't really figure out a good hook and also why my youtube channel is failing because i can't figure out how to make a thumbnail and or compelling title i mean look at these things look at them So, let us commence with the story of Between Two Fires. Our story opens up at a fire. What do you know? What a shocker. We are introduced to four characters. Tomas, Godfroy, Jacoit, Jacoit, Jaco, Jaco, I think it's Jaco. Again, friends do not like how you decide to make your language. And one that is only referred to as the fat one. These names are fairly relevant, but also not really important, aside from Thomas. See, the four of them are a bunch of brigands. They've been stealing, pillaging the entire countryside because they don't have any honest skills amongst them. Except maybe Thomas. Again, foreshadowing. We will see that they take this donkey that was tied that was they found wandering in woods and take it to a local barn, cook it, butcher it, and are eating it. When a small golden child, a girl, wanders in and asks them for food and for help. This little girl was told by an angel that one of them could be trusted and in that she asked them for help with burying her father His, her father had to come to the plague and has just been kind of rotting in their house the donkey was in fact their donkey parsnip poor parsnip gone too soon real shame you know well, this is where we get our first hint that people are not really good or nice in fr during this time. See, Godfroy has a certain proclivity for cupcakes. He's kind of disrespectful and honestly a little creepy. He invites the girl to sit by him. She does not. And they send Jacoit, the the guy I cannot pronounce his name, uh, who's described as having a droopy eye, so I'm going to refer to him as Droopy Eye Guy from now on. Droopy Eye Guy goes out to bring her back. When they return 
from her having run up a tree. She has a tendency to do that, as you'll find out later on. Thomas has killed Godfrey and the fat one. See, Thomas did not like the idea of Godfrey being disrespectful or into cupcakes and decided that he had had enough and killed the two while the girl and the droopy eye were gone. From here, we get a scene of Thomas breaking the droopy eye man's crossbow crank so that the man could not use the crossbow. The girl is curious as to this, as to why he would not break the actual weapon, and he says it's too beautiful. It's said it to have a description of the Last Supper on it. I'm curious how big this crossbow was. Besides the point, he then enlists the droopy-eyed man's help in burying her father and just leave him tied up to a tree. In this, the small girl has attached herself to Thomas and decides to go with him. Tomas so far is not really that interesting of a character. See, he's gruff, curses up a storm, he's basically a sailor, and does not really have any preference to have a small child that is described to have twig legs following behind him. He makes it an effort to not learn her name so that he would not have any attachment to her. So that he can continue on living his debaucherous life. Well, uh, it doesn't work out. Uh, th the girl follows him, so all of his efforts to try to dissuade her don't work. It's, you know, brats will be brats, I guess. So for Thomas's first thought, he goes to the local town to possibly pass off the girl to a priest that is known to, well, I guess, be a part of that parish, and that the girl knows as well. They can't find the priest. He's dead from plague, as most people are. And that night, after deciding to rest for the night and figure out how else to offload the child, the small, innocent little girl has a dream. She dreams to head to Paris, France, and then to Avignon. Why or for what reason, we do not know yet. And it is all the more mysterious to the girl as she just has a dream to head there. Not knowing why she would go there other than to head there. And through some shenanigans with a fox mask, Thomas decides to take her along with him to Paris. Why they're going there, again, not sure, other than it was given to her by a dream. And as I mentioned earlier, she has the ability to talk to angels. So, for the reader's perspective, at this point, we are believing there is a supernatural element to her having to go to Paris and then Avignon. Avignon is also mentioned at this point to be where the Pope is, so that is the one thing that we can ascertain, that her quest and journey has to do something with the Pope. With what? We're not sure. I keep repeating that. It's very important. <laughs> As they are traveling, Thomas reveals that he was once married, was a knight, and had children before losing them for some reason. He doesn't tell the small, perky child that yet, but we will f soon learn as to why he is now a brigand chauffeuring a small bratty child. Like, I can't stress enough how annoying she was to me in the, the beginning chapters of this book. Like, she she re re reminded me of Vivian, Viviana, whoever the one girl is from the Warbreaker series, the book, not the series. Honestly, really annoying until the like very last chapter. They make it to a town called Saint Martin La Peru Peru Peru. They make it to this village so that they could hopefully cross a bridge that Thomas knows to be there. 
Uh, the bridge was burned because the villagers decided how best to stop the plague from getting to our village. Let's burn the bridge so that no one can walk across. Okay. Uh, joke's on them. The plague is, like, everywhere else. So they kind of just burned their own bridge. And what is instead taking place, there is a eel frog monster to be just, you know, chilling at the banks so that now no one wants to cross over be because... They may or may not be eaten by said monstrosity. Now, this monstrosity isn't too believable at the point. Uh, we meet a priest who tells them this and is also the first one to directly hear from Tomas what happened. Why is he a brigand? This is the first part of the story that we get a true sense of the redemption that is beginning to unfold. See, Tomas was knighted at a fairly young age, not having any real power or stay, simply being knighted as a last-ditch attempt to give their forces more knights at a battle he survives the battle and is now left as a knight and goes all the way to the battle of pressy a real battle that i found out about in research that it uh really gets the terror of the real battle as the de de the battle as described in the book really much re oh my goodness the battle as described in the book mirrors the horror that I was reading as I was researching whether or not the Battle of Pressy was real, and uh, it was, so that's woohoo. Historical relevancy. See, at the Battle of Pressy, the French were men on their infantry and horses charging towards the English up on a hill that had the longbowmen. And in said battle, the longbowmen kind of just, you know, strung it back and then let loose, killing many, many knights and lords. Many seniors as well. And in this, Tomas is injured. He gets a arrow through his tongue while his lord gets a not-so-happy multiple arrows to the chest <laughs> his lord dies while thomas lives he gains a nasty scar in the process of removing said arrow the surgeon had to cut his mouth open to be able to get at the arrow snip it out pull it out and thomas is left recuperating for days and days he then learns that the oh i, uh, I can say it in my head but wh what was his name Oh, there it is. <clears throat> the Le Comte de Vere. De, de Vere. Uh, it's not spelled of that. Comte is spelled C-O-M-T-E. <laughs> Why? Why do you do this? See, the Comte was able to treaty with the English so that they would stop getting massacred. And in some way was able to take Thomas's lands. That included his wife and children. Or one child. I don't believe he had multiple. I believe he just had one. Uh, so, you know, kick him while he's down, you know. He's recovering from a nasty wound to the tongue. Just lost his lord. Oh, and also his wife and child are no longer his. His lands are no longer his. His holdings, everything to his knighthood is gone. See, the, the church made up a bunch of reasons to give him excommunication. But we learned the truth that it was all stolen from him and they cast him aside. He tells this to the priest and in telling this to the priest, the priest makes the revolutionary choice to offer Tomas the ability to redeem himself by becoming a knight again and fighting whatever monstrosity 
is in the lake. River. Not lake. It's not a lake. It's a river. It's the first kind of inclination of what this story will eventually unfold to be. That there are powerful forces, both man and otherwise. And that there is the power to either embrace debauchery or to rise above it. See, part of the issue with Thomas is his, not just that he was disavowed of everything he was, but that he embraced it. There's a line in the book that he says he, being damned, decided to damn himself, to become damnable. It's a very interesting motif to say everything's down and out. I don't have anything else to do. Might as well embrace it. It hits me especially as we kind of see that story so many times in modern media of these people that are treated poorly by society or by other people and decide to embrace it and become villains, anti-heroes, whatever, what have you. But ultimately, what it is, is them embracing the damnation that was bestowed upon them and then forking it over to others. Okay, so I just said how the priest offers Thomas the way to redeem himself by fighting off the monster of the lagoon, the lake, the river, and he... At first is hesitant, but eventually decides to go ahead with it. The next day, he, the priest, the girl, and then two others, a drunk person and a farmer, go to the river bed. The monster at first does not appear it takes them a while to go it out of the water and when it does it is truly horrific it is described as a frog eel monstrosity glossy eyes scale or not i guess oily skin not scales spines it has spines though and a very peculiar mention of at the end of its tail a white hand this is not important yet but it will be and i want you to keep that in mind that white hands mean something the battle is pretty interesting uh, i've i've seen i guess better eel fights but then again who am i to judge i don't know how i'd feel about fighting a massive eel that at one point Eats the farmer whole. That's right. The one guy, one of the guys that came with them, one ran away, but the other one got eaten whole. And I can only imagine it's like a, the, it's it's a lizard that catches a bird or a small a smaller lizard in its mouth and then slowly like gulps it down. It, it's a horrifying thought, especially as. I imagined it on uh, myself, and I was like, I couldn't, I don't, I don't want to think about being swallowed by something that, if I'm going head first, can I even, like, do anything? My arms are probably pinned to my side, I'm pr probably going to die unless someone else gets me out. Unfortunately, Tomas is unable to get it out. <laughs> get the farmer out. But that doesn't mean it's all for naught as he's able to defeat it but not without taking substantial injury he gets a wound to the groin some other abrasions and is bleeding out while also having been nearly drowned he's able to make it to the shore but then he collapses so at this point in the story, what is kind of the main intention is 
Tomas was a knight, disavowed of everything, became a brigand, did horrific things, found a girl, redeems himself, and ends up dying. It's a very interesting story, and at least when I was reading it, it very much felt like, okay, this is how he chose to die, because it's right there. It's all structured right there. The beginning, middle, end, and then also there's the hope eventually of the girl continuing on her journey. Well, joke's on you. Give me one second, I gotta... That all happened by chapter 5 of this book. <laughs> by 5th chapter, our protagonist has... Gone through the entire story of <laughs> redemption. Uh, well, not yet. We get a interesting side tangent with a plagued woman that is dying and decides to go to the river to quench her thirst because it's the only thing that can quench it and in it we get this weird scene of this dying woman wedding thomas who she finds on the side of the riverbed who is dead when she finds him but in the context of what occurs i believe to be resuscitation cpr if you will that she kisses him and breathes life back into him. So that he is no longer just, you know. But. And. Also gives him the plague. Because the priest finds him the next uh, few hours later. And I think it's a few hours. It might be the next day. I... But. He now has the plague and is suffering horribly from having gotten nearly neutered and having nearly been drowned. And then also he's dealing with the plague now. So, you know, he's just having a ripe old time of it. Here comes the next two things to show us that the little girl is special. That small, sassy, golden child. She has a conversation with a dead saint and is informed of a statue that gives out healing a statue of mary she is to take thomas there for him to be healed and the second thing to occur is she asks the priest to come with them to give them direction to help her along the way she is still a small little sarcastic child and she rebukes him when he refuses by calling him by his name which up until this point we have not heard and she especially has not heard she knows his name and this is when we learn his name to be matthew with the weirdest spelling I've ever seen this side of the Mississippi. Pierre Matthew. And with this, he chooses to go with them. Very interesting, isn't it? She has the ability to learn things that she should not. Angels. Keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, this is this is more fun than the first recording. The first recording I, I felt way worse. <laughs> Dr. Pepper, let's go. Number two, baby. Let's go. Let's go. The trip to the statue is filled with a lot of annoyances. See, they run into a mob, and this mob is there to reclaim the statue to take it back to their town because it had supposedly been stolen at some point. I don't know. I also don't care. Uh, the main thing to note is the mob is led by a priest that has a little devil by its elbow. Uh, the girl points this out to them and to us uh, and they're all like <laughs> so you know they're not really happy about that they make it to the statue nothing's happened 
Oh, except for the statue. The, the statue is actually magical, has supernatural powers, does actually heal people because the town is filled with way more healthy men and women and children than they've seen anywhere else anywhere. Uh, so then the mob just uh, decides to, if we can't have it, no one can, and they destroy it. Yeah, pretty sad. The only thing to heal Thomas of the plague, gone. Oh, wait, no, joke's on them. Uh, she's able to grab one of Mary's arms before it loses its power, touches it to him, and heals him. So this is this is the first thing that uh, when I was reading, I was like, that's Catholic. Hold there. Hold up. Hold the phone. See, in Catholic belief, there's a reliance on holy items. The idea of, say, the veil of Christ or the, the bones of a saint or something else. I'm not too rehearsed on them, but I n understand the idea that in Catholic church, like, history, they believe these things to have power bestowed either upon them by God, Jesus, or by, well, saints. So, this was the first time I was like, okay, so in this world, Catholic ideas of faith and power are real. J just a note. We'll come back to it, but it's a, it's a note for now. I don't know where that came from. Was that you? Oh, okay. This is where we get introduced to the attorney. See, as they're traveling, they encounter a herald of this lord's castle that is holding a tournament and they are told to revel all day all night don't stop the singing don't stop the feasting enjoy all for the plague is gone they have somehow been able to remove the plague and they don't have to worry about it fantastic that's what i'm talking about this is great news right no because a little sassy golden child will not go with them she refuses and goes up a tree and stays there. So, Tomas and the priest, who I'm going to continue to call the priest because I can't say his name without feeling guilt that I'm saying it wrong because it's French, <laughs> go to the castle, to the tournament instead. We get to see a very interesting scene at a, that of a banquet. At said banquet... They are offered monkey brain. So there is a senor at this banquet that is really emphatically delighted at monkey's brain. And he asks the priest to say, this is my brain. In Latin. This is important because this is my brain can be very closely translated to this is my body. Take of it. Which is in reference to the Last Supper. When Jesus broke bread and shared the wine with his 12 disciples. Well, at the time, 11, but you, you get the idea. And this is a hint at something's wrong. See, why why would he want him to say that? Is, is that indicative of anything good? I'm curious. I, I wonder. I'm sure we'll find out. Oh, and by the way, uh, to say this is my brain in Latin, or... Yeah, this is my brain. And that is hawk est cerebrum meum. Well, then. I can speak Latin now. I actually have a friend that took Latin in high school. I'm curious if he would better be able to resolve 
this conundrum of mine. I have no idea. The other thing to note of this is that the seniors a uh, very particular taste in having the music always playing. See, there was a hurdy-gurdy player that had stopped playing when he had asked the priest to say, this is my brain in Latin. The senior did not take kindly to this. No, my goodness, he did not. See, the guy takes the hurdy-gurdy player's arm and breaks it with a goblet. Might be a mug, but goblet works too. Oh my goodness, dude. It's just some music. He can start playing again in five seconds. He was just curious as to what would occur. Oh, but this scene can be seen as... Oh my, this scene can be seen... Oh, I'm, I'm such a great illiterist. This whole debacle can be viewed as a... Embracing of pleasure. See, the priest... Finally said it after getting promised more wine and kind of being pressured into it. But still, he gets some more wine to drink and he gets to eat of the monkey's brain. He indulges the peers around him of their infatuation. I wonder. We continue on. Tomas fancies uh one of the ladies there and sleeps with her for the night well part of the night because as it turns out the tourney is a night tournament and tomas is now a part of it part of why they were allowed to go to the castle was if thomas would fight and he goes out and immediately starts getting a horrific sinking feeling that this is not right he should run. He should get out of there now. He can't really because all around him are the people egging him on. The armorers being like, okay, you're all set. Oh, gross. There's some weird stuff on your your sword. We're not going to touch that. And he goes out to see as one of the knights is killed. This is not a fun, whimsical tournament. No, this is a duel of death a ballad if you will one where whoever wins survives and whoever loses well they kind of get a one-way ticket to you know rest forever as he's fighting this other person theobald he makes some good cuts gets some injuries in on this other knight and something very interesting happens he <laughs> the guy begins to spew water. He has a striking resemblance to the frog thing Thomas had just killed prior to this engagement. It has a white hand. And Thomas realizes that this is a devil work Ooh. he realizes this is a tournament of debauchery sin gluttony and lust as he realizes this as he's cutting at theobald he has to kill him or else he'll die he's getting banged up his jaw is broken his leg is busted up and the lord of the castle begins to roar at thomas to fight to kill to kill interesting Tomas kills Theobald and as he does the Lord approaches him morphing into a black maned lion man whenever I think of this I think of the creature lion man on Modern Horizons 3 deck boxes and also the commander of the one Phyrexian set, uh, commander deck that I have back there. The, the latter one does fit it right because it's a corrupted representation of what a lion should be. But I'm not here for that. You're here for what comes next. And 
as this is unfolding, we get this sinking feeling that this is the end. Everything's going to die. Everyone's going, or not everything, Every everyone there is going to die, and we're going to be left without a protagonist again. My goodness. Tomas just can't stop nearly dying. Kenny. And then, well, daylight. The sun rises, and everything vanishes. Everything was a mirage, an illusion that was projected to him he is not actually injured he was not actually fighting anything and it's all gone this is a very interesting thought for this book that i haven't seen anywhere else uh well i guess you could kind of see it in demon slayer but that's up because of other reasons Actually, I'd have to remind myself about Demon Slayer if the demons can be out in the sun or not, because it very much feels like the vampire stuff. Demon Slayer tangent. Demon Slayer. The demons are just vampires. I mean, everyone pretty much understands that. If you just look at them, they consume blood, they feast on livestock, either humans or otherwise. Uh, they also take blood from hospitals, because... How evil. But what I want to quickly discuss is the connections between the demons and vampires. Because if demons are basically vampire inserts, are we to then say that vampires are just demons? Yes, yes we are. We are in fact to say that demons are vampires and vampires are demons, vice versa. If we look at the acclaimed podcast Haunted Cosmos, they very much said this. That's a deep cut for anyone who knows who they are. <laughs> the demons in Demon Slayer are essentially vampires while pulling on the myths and origins, the mysticisms of the yokai, the demons in Japanese folklore. Now, if you are to believe in such spiritual things, then, as I do, you would very much believe that they are, in fact, almost one-to-one -one interpretations of possible demons that actually exist in Christendom. Just some slight variations on it. But I do think it is very interesting how they, there is a parallel between specific yokai and demons in Demon Slayer. But more so, the most interesting element that I want to talk about briefly is vampires and sunlight. See, vampires and sunlight make so much sense. They're evil, they're nocturnal, their skin is old, decayed, sunlight will decay it all the faster. But for a demon to be allergic to sunlight, that's not something that I've seen expressed except for in folklore and now in medieval times between two fires and i think it's a fun and interesting take on how demons interact with the world and how the world is both their domain while also being their prison see what is the sun representative oh i don't know maybe the sun the literal son of god and how the light of a new day, a new dawn, is poisonous and detrimental to them. While the night, the shadows, that is what allows them to thrive. Just an interesting thought. I don't think I said interesting there, but I meant to. And I hope... Now back to the video. Upon waking up, Tomas and the priest are meted by Delphine, who asks them to leave. And they're like, yeah, I guess so. I guess everything we did the last, like, eight hours didn't actually happen. And they continue on their way, making to Paris. 
if you remember, I earlier said that they had to go to Paris for some reason. And we still don't know what that reason is, but there is that sense that, okay, something is going to happen here because this is why we need to go there. There's something here for them to do. In entering the city, they run into a lady that sells them a key to a house that the door is broken that they could stay in. Uh, they're not going to stay in that house. It's filled with dead bodies and it, it's been a latrine for passerbys. And they decide to sit in this one courtyard and just wait out the night. The girl is sitting in the courtyard and an angel tells her to start singing a song that she likes and she's like, I don't want to, but the angel's like, please sing. She does and a carpenter hears her and offers to give them all lodging, saying it only for her to sing it again. Ooh, supernatural. Not the show. I'm not talking about this. The, uh, this encounter with the carpenter and his wife, I don't remember their names. I didn't write them down. And honestly, they're not too relevant or important, as you'll see in five minutes. They, they embrace them in, and you get the sense that this is going to be where the girl stays. Both Thomas and the priest are thinking this, and we have no reason to not believe them at this point. Another reason why it's kind of thought that they would be the place for them to stay is because upon them entering in, the carpenter asks for Delphine's name, who, if you recall, Tomas did not want to learn and had not learned up until this point, and the priest had just never mentioned it had never thought to ask her. He was just fine with referring to her as girl or just talking to her, but he did not he did not have any reason to know her name for however long they I think they've been traveling for a few days together at this point. Very very interesting kind of shows you the heart again of both Thomas and the priest, both of them feeling regret at this not knowing her after having gone through what they've gone through, they feel more kinship for each other, all three of them. As they're staying with the couple of carpenter and wife, they decide to go out to market to get food for a nice little feast because the wife of the carpenter is like, yes, I got a daughter again, and she wants to celebrate. Their whole intention is to take in the daughter, Delphine, as their own so that's pretty cool upon them getting to the market though is where we discover why they're there see Delphine has wrapped herself like a monkey around a table leg of this one merchant selling holy items items thought to have been passed down directly from Jesus's crucifixion and other saintly items imbued with powers Interesting. So she knows about the Statue of Mary being powerful, having supernatural abilities, and now she is here wanting to get something there. She doesn't, she fully doesn't understand what it is yet, but she's like, it's here, and everyone's just annoyed at this small, sassy child. While they're arguing and trying to peel the girl away, a mob forms and nabs the merchant. With these wares. See, he is a Jew, and Jews have been banned from Paris. There is a debate of whether or not if he's Jewish or not. He is said to have been christened as that he believes in Christ. Uh, and also, I think it's a very interesting that the way that they prove he's a Jew is just by pulling his pants down, because if you know, you know. And they throw him in stocks. Everyone goes home. 
Delphine can't stand this, though, as she runs to the stocks and frees him. That key that had been given to them by the lady for the house that they could have stayed at if they wanted to live in rat and piss was a key to the stockade. So they let him go. He has on his person the spearhead that had pierced Jesus' side. He gives this to her as this is the item that she is meant to get here in Paris. And as they're leaving, the Jew asks them, is it time? And at this point, we don't know what that means, but there are two things that come to my head. One is, is it time for my death? Or two, is Jesus here? Is Jesus coming back? The second one does not make too much sense at this point. But it will. Something I had neglected to mention was partly why they couldn't stay out at night is because people in Paris have been disappearing every night. Something takes them, kills them, they disappear. And whatever it is has come a-knockin'. This is the, in my opinion, scariest scene of the book. See, what comes a-knocking are stone statues that have come to life through demonic powers. And we get this depiction of Mother Mary covered in blood holding a crying, plague-ridden child. Mary, being a stone statue, can't really uh, be fought against or destroyed too well with, you know, a sword or your fists. Ever try punching a stone wall? It hurts a lot. I've, I have. Would not recommend. Zero out of ten. The carpenter and his wife are killed. And the trio leave the town that very night with two things of note. One being they burned Paris down. Uh, they have a traveling mule that has been carrying a cart with them. And it knocked over some candles that lit everything up in a carpentry shop on fire and started burning the carpenter's house and everyone else is around them. And the second thing of note is that he, the, as they're leaving, the Apostle Paul statue, likewise covered in blood, having killed who knows how many people in Paris, says this. St. Paul turned his stone head and looked squarely at Pierre Matthew. The priest felt an icy finger in his heart. And then his head exploded in pain as St. Paul assaulted him with a wordless shout. Do you like this, bugger priest? We did this for you, you filthy bugger, sodomite, drunk, who the f*** do you think you're fooling? Would you like to climb up here with me and hoist those ropes? Hoc est enum virgum meum. There's some more that it says, but I'm not comf I don't feel comfortable with saying them. So I'm not. Uh, but basically, they're going to say, you're going to do some horrible things to the little girl. But what's to note is the very first phrase that I read to you. The phrase about him being a bugger. <laughs> See, there have been some hints throughout the story so far that the priest deals with longings of the homoerotic nature. He went through a ordeal with a young man at the town that we first met him at. He was involved in a homosexual relationship with a boy of the town. Very real moment of regret, sin, and dealing with the 
pleasure of the flesh while trying to serve the spirit. We get the story told to us by the priest to Tomas in a roundabout way. See, when the priest decided to tell Tomas this, he had said in the story to Tomas that it was a girl that he had been fornicating with. But in reality, it was the man. Tomas immediately picks up on this and realizes the truth. But I think it's a very interesting point of even in admitting his sin and admitting his fault, he is hiding the entirety of it, or at least trying to. Telling partial truths to cover up the full truth so that he can feel the relief of confessing without Thomas fully knowing what he is. However, we know fully what he is, and Thomas figures that out because he's a smart muffin. So they agree as both both being damned men to continue on journeying together as it isn't an issue. Next is one of the scenes that I'm going to leave as bare bones as possible because it's one of my least favorite scenes of the book simply because of its implications and I don't know it, 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 of all the book chapters and scenes it gives me the most icky feeling a demon creeps it its way in to Thomas's head and nearly gets him to do things to the girl He rejects this, fights against it, and is triumphant against the evil. In this scene, it brings him and the girl closer. Something to do with having that ability to do such a horrible thing, but restraining, and especially as... She sees it. She sees the demon that is co coercing him. So she feels all the more safer with him as he was able to fight it off. Also, she is now a woman. So let's leave it at that. So uh, for, for that that's for different reasons, though. Very weird scene. It does inspire some sort of jealousy and the priest as he notices both Tomas and Delphine being closer in a paternal sense so that's that's an interesting thing to note but they continue on their way until they run into the dwarf crucified yep you heard it right uh, they encounter a scene. Uh, they they encounter a dwarf on a cross, saying that he has to stay up there for another two days so that his town can be rid of the plague. See, the penitents are this group that is milling about the countryside, and saying that if you suffer with them, or are willing to hang on a cross for three days, the plague will be gone. You'll be healed. Part of this is they, their well, their leader, Rogier, has the ability to bring the dead back to life. The dead, however, don't look too good and kind of remind me of a certain creature of horror classic. More on that later. Delphine can't ha let this be, and she intervenes with the penitents, reveals them to be a just straight up demon. Rogier is just a demon, 
masquerading about as a man with his penitence. And he makes a, a little ruckus of this, nearly kills Delphine, an angel saves her, and then the angel fights off the demon he becomes. Now, this is... What? Rogier is not too happy about Delphine intervening and returning the recently alive again dead people back to being dead. So he binds her up, nearly dashes her against some rocks. An angel intervenes, saves her. Rogier turns into a 12 eyed demon with six wings and begins to fight the angel. And a curious note a lion headed knight appears as well a lion-headed knight on a horse with a human mouth and human hands for feet or i guess hooves because it's a horse we get a fight between a two demons and an angel it does not go well the demons triumph destroying the angel they nearly get delphine but they are able the angel is able to save her and they are able to get away from the monsters leaving the town that they had been in in complete ruins it's absolutely destroyed mangled a disaster a catastrophe rubbish <laughs> The final note to make is of the demon with the six wings, six arms, twelve eyes, has hands of white. So, for those of you very intelligent and smart in the brain area, being able to determine what does that mean implies one thing. Things with white hands are demonic in nature. This answers some questions that we have. So the eel monster that Tomas first star started by fighting uh, was demonic of some sort. The lion is a demon. I mean, we were pretty confident from when Thomas fought him that we were as well. Uh, and now we are introduced to a second demon with 12 eyes. So, demons are ripe about everything is going to absolute chaos. They are doing everything they can to kill and destroy. And they really do not like the girl with the spearhead that pierced Christ's side heading to Avignon. They encounter a Italian man that is on his way back to Italy to be with his wife. The reason why I bring this up is because this is the second indication of Delphine maturing, as she has an immediate crush on this man and imagines him caressing her, patting her hair like a dog. She warns him off, and they continue on their way, but it's just an interesting note to make that she is now becoming more and more so they decide to find a raft or some sort of barge who travel the river all the way to avignon good idea don't you think very good idea don't you think right right good idea right that's a good idea right is it it's a good idea right upon them making it to the river they find a barge to ferry them along their way and who's ready to be a pirate because thomas is inducted into a barge that uses him for piracy. I told you how Thomas earlier was basically a sailor with his mouth. Well, now he is a sailor in true. He, the barge and the people running it use him as just a big scary guy to scare people that they steal from to give them their stuff. Some of the stuff I don't fully understand why you steal. Like, they, they stop a barge that is carrying just chunks of marble. Like...
that might be a little suspicious. And also, how are you going to transfer that once you get off the barge? Are you just going to keep it on your barge? I don't really know what their whole plan was. Doesn't really matter, as after a few days of this, the pirates in charge of the barge look through their stuff and find some gold that they had been keeping from said pirates. So everyone wakes up. They get in a battle. Tomas kills a few of them, much to the chagrin of Delphine, as she does not want Thomas to kill. Uh, throughout the story, she's restated. She does not want Thomas to kill. Uh, he's kind of ignored her up until this point, and this is the this is the part where it really hits because she is pleading with him right before she he cuts the throat of the pirate captain. Little little interesting point. Thomas is still rejecting parts of the redemption. He does not fully believe in whatever it is that Delphine has. Though the priest is all in. He is fully in at this point. He is fully willing to take everything that this girl is going to throw at him. And follow her wherever. It's actually interesting. The book. Okay, so so taking us out of the story right now, the book is broken into chapters that can follow multiple characters. We've gotten chapters with Delphine, most weekly with Thomas, uh, some with some brief other characters, the woman that married Thomas at the uh, river bed, uh, some other people to set some dressing before we get introduced to our scenes. And there is one scene with the priest. And that is the scene where a monk in white tempts him to kill the girl. And he will be given his word worldly pleasures. He'll be given the boy that he had been infatuated with. He'll be given young women. He'll be given riches all the drink he could want he is kind of a drunkard and he chooses not to go through with it and rejects the demonic offer i think it's a interesting choice of the book to introduce the priest as the last of the main trio but have his story and arc in a sense conclude first he is fully in, he is fully rededicated and willing to follow Delphine on her journey. And we will see the conclusion of that very shortly. Thomas had not killed everyone on that barge. There had been one man that had been that had helped them because he had recognized Thomas of having been at the Battle of Pressy. The, scene, the battle that Thomas had gotten injured and had his lands and everything stolen from him. So in this, the four of them continue on the barge down the river until they make it to a dam of human bodies and dead animals. Bodies with no heads, just floating, floating. In the water, they see a white hand. They try to get to shore, but are pulled back by tentacles. Tentacles adorned with the heads of dead animals and dead men and women. They flop onto the barge, ripping, tearing, attacking, stinging. They get dunked into the water. The priest is holding the girl up above his head as he gets stung repeatedly. Tomas is hoisted up out of the water, not as well, but still out of the water by the man that had helped them fight off the pirates earlier. The man is stung so many times, his heart stops, and he sinks, being dragged under by the tentacles. Tomas makes it to the shore with the priest and the girl. 
to make it to a local, a local, I guess, person's house. And they quickly realize that Pierre Matthew is dying. They spend the last hours with him. Delphine has a moment where she learns to play the lute. The lute! Let's go! Fantastic instrument. Let's go. It's so cool to see a lute. On Pierre Matthews' final night, we get moments by hearth. And we get moments where Delphine picks up a lute and plays a song to ease him as he dies. The trick of this is that she does not know how to play the lute, and it is the ability that she has had throughout this entire story that is building up in her that is able to play the lute and play that song. He dies and is buried, along with the old man that had let them in, as he was close to death as well. He was old. Matthew was a good, devout man, though with flaws. And his story ends just like that. Redeeming himself by not killing the Gore Earl, by in fact saving her from death and we are to follow Tomas and Delphine as they continue on the irony of this is they are just a few short days away from Avignon where Matthew's brother Robert resides Partly why Matthew had decided to follow them was because to see his brother because the town he had been in was there was no nothing for him there as the people no longer trusted him as priest because of the sin that he was found in and because they didn't come to him for confession or listen to his messages. Again, if you, you're a man that has, that has been found in sin, has been found to be counter to what you preach hypocrite what people would listen to you but th those town people will not know that in the end he would willingly lay down his life for another we are then split up we have chapters following three different characters Tomas Delphine and Robert. Delphine, having decided that too many people have died on her quest, leaves Tomas in the middle of the night to continue on the way to Avignon by herself. Tomas, not liking this, charges after her as soon as he wakes up, and we get introduced to Robert, who, in a weird twist of fate, is a consort of a bishop. He is just a man living out his days, appeasing, or not, not the, not, I'm sorry, I'm not bishop, the cardinal, I misspoke, appeasing the cardinal. He was a priest, but was a priest for a very short time, and is just kind of milling about his days. But... There's more to his story. Get there in a minute. When we follow Delphine, <laughs> she goes on her little adventure trotting through towns, villages. But the main highlight of it is her night in a abandoned abbey. All the nuns are dead, but in the middle of the night, someone coaxes her to give them the spearhead, to abandon it and give it to them 
she can stop and she can go about her life. As they argue over this, the voice gets more and more persistent to give me the spearhead and Delphine being the little tree climber she is climbs into a tree to spend the night okay 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 so so what happened with this scene immediately immediately clued me into what Delphine is I did not play it off the best but this scene is exactly the type of temptation that Jesus was offered by the devil. And with that, we know who Delphine is. She is Jesus Christ, reincarnated into a girl, a small sassy child. Isn't that when I when I re was reading through the book, this scene hit, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting. I like that. I like that." Now it's more of like I'm I'm trying to figure out the whole I the idea that is put forward in the story of that. But I'm gonna leave that until after I finish the book. Um, and also, it plays into the narrative of the story as. We've been seeing more and more of her powers as she's matured. She's turned into a woman. She's grown, understanding more and more what her mission is. And after this night, she understands everything. She has more or less complete control of her powers and knows why she's going to Avignon. Very similar to how once Jesus resisted the temptation of the devil... He was able to come fully into who he was as the Christ here on earth. Tomas isn't doing too well, though, because the guy is like frantically trying to find his adopted daughter. Because at this point, he now fully admits that he cares for the girl and wants to protect her at all costs girl can't can't find her anywhere it's like freaking out it's like where the heck is she where is she where is she where is she where is she um he gets grabbed by a mob that sees him and thinks he's him to be an englishman uh, and are about to kill him before he reveals to them he's french and well okay technically he's norman but i i don't understand I don't understand friends. I'm American. Make it a little bit easier for me. I'm, I'm a little just joking. It's not like those words. Oh my goodness. Your words suck. The chat means cat. What? They. Freak. When Tomas is brought to the priest at the local church after having revealed that he's French. He is christened again. Rededicated. Rededicated to kill Englishmen wherever he finds them. And in the context of the story, is rededicated to the knight. Being a knight. A man seeking to be chivalrous, and to serve a higher purpose. We then see how Tomas is fully bracing his rechristening as he almost immediately after leaving that parish uh, runs into Englishmen, but following the example that Delphine asked of him, he does not kill them. He finds them in a bathhouse, but he does not kill them. He leaves them be, having ma having made direct eye contact with them, with them knowing he could have killed them, but he chose not to. He then passes on 
having accepted the call that Delphine had put up to him. A very important moment. And the point where he is now fully... Oh, wait. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no, he's not. Because you know what just happens? He runs into the Comte de Vore, the guy that stole everything from him. As he's hiking to Avignon, he runs into the very guy that stole everything. And being a good stand-up honor-bound man he is, he requests a duel. Through no sorts of shenanigans, he gets it. And in said duel, he has the upper hand and is about to take the Comte. When one of his squire guys, one of his lackeys, bops him over the head, knocking him out. But right before he's knocked out, he sees one of the squires getting an arrow spreaded between the eyes. We then get a cut of the scene that the Englishman that Tomas had not killed in the bathhouse had come upon them and killed everyone. Picking through the aftermath, they one recognizes Tomas and in a sign of gratitude and a gesture of kindness, of mercy, he does not kill Tomas passed out on the ground. And also at this point, it would have really sucked because like we've had so many fake outs of Tomas dying at this point. It's like, okay, either kill him or don't. It, it's, it's gotten to that point. Come on, guys. And we see the ramifications of Tomas's choices coming in. He did not kill them and they did not kill him. <laughs> okay, so the, the next scene that occurs, guys, is the... A, one of the weirdest scenes of the book because I don't think there's any sort of precedence biblic biblically or otherwise to indicate it. And I don't really know uh, if it, he just, the author, Christopher Buhlman, decided to do this or if it was a thing hinted at that and stuff that I haven't researched or learned about. But... Give me one second. Delphine finds Tomas and shapeshifts him to look like the Comte de Vore. De Vere, However you say it. I don't know how you're supposed to say this word. I just don't. I have no idea. This is also where we learn that they are heading to Avignon because the Pope is not the Pope. The Pope is about to fully commence a crusade against Jerusalem. To retake the Holy Lands. To rid the plague from Paris. From France. From everything. And while on the surface this appears good, it is not. Well, well, it's obviously not because it's, the Pope is a demon. Demon Pope. Uh, Popeology, if you will. <laughs> uh, I wrote that word in my notebook, but I don't remember how I was going to implicate it initially in the script. So I, I just wanted to throw it in there. When we... Okay. <laughs> so then we get a switch up of... Going back to Robert... And we are told of the commencements of the th the crusade, that the Jews are behind part of the plague, uh, that they're going to uh, eradicate the Jews. So anti-Semitism for the win. Woohoo. Oh, yeah, this is I'm sure this is good. That soundbite is not going to look well in, like f if anyone ever clips me. We get some more background into Robert and his life not not too relevant here but this is a brief summary i'm going over this i'm hoping to under explain the entire book in less than two hours a book that when reading is like 13 14 hours 
Whew. Yeah, I've left out a few things. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. When... All right, how, how's the, what's the best way I should say this? Explain this. Tomas and Delphine sneak into it as he is appearing to be the Comte and she is appearing to be as his squire. Uh, there's some nerve-wracking scenes and Delphine eventually sneaks off to meet Robert who is informed of the Pope being not so good and the death of his brother which he does not believe he is like no not gonna have anything to do with this don't know who you are don't trust you the fact that you know my brother is really weird and does not believe them delphine then later uh tries to convince robert by taking him to the pope's vineyard where He has zombies picking his grapes to make wine. Let's go. Freaking zombies. Earlier I mentioned the dead thing. How there was de the dead being brought back to life. And how sh uh, Delphine put them back to being dead. When this scene happened, I just immediately alarms went off. And I was like, this is in fact... The quintessential medieval zombie book. Because they're there. They're horrifying. They are The implications are creepy. And I want to play Blight Survival as soon as possible. Please give me a beta. Give me an alpha test. Anything. I want to play this game. Dude. So much. This book makes me want to play a zombie medieval game all the more. Oh. Also, the medieval horror makes a lot more sense now because everything I've explained so far hasn't been too scary, but the, the scene of hearing of the dead picking and harvesting grapes to make wine, absolutely terrifying. This game, I feel, are a perfect mix of you're not really certain about the dead people being brought back to life by the penitents. Uh, you're a little off put by it and then you get the scene with the vineyard and you're like oh my goodness they're zombies it's so good i absolutely love it and it le leaves a level of fantasy to the story that is otherwise like fan fantastical but not like traditional fantasy and i think zombies in medieval fantasy are usually well honestly i haven't read a story with medieval zombies so i think it's really cool and makes me really really excited to see it in this because they're in it in a way that doesn't over impede and doesn't run over the whole plot of like oh my goodness there are zombies now and when they show up they're brief they're terrifying and just makes it all the more impactful that they're there while not overshadowing the greater fact of there's a 12-eyed demon a lion-headed demon honestly this is fantastic it's fantastic. Uh, Robert does not believe this and immediately snitches and tells the Pope. Yeah. And in return, the Pope turns him into a new cardinal. Well, show's over, folks. Tomas is apprehended and tortured, getting his... removed his fingernails cut off oh freaky oh gross stuff delphine escapes notice and with the help of a doctor and his assistant retrieve tomas from the basement to remind you he still looks like the comte de vor and upon retrieving him thomas's real body walks out of a river kisses the Comte de Devore's body on the mouth and Tomas is transferred from the Comte's body to his original body.
getting away with it. They just can't keep getting away with it. What is this? They can't just keep getting away with it. So now we have the final leg of our journey. Delphine, Thomas, and his original body enter the coronation ceremony of the Cardinal Robert as he embraces the flesh and the pleasure, the, the, the debauchery of this world over the righteous journey that his brother had chosen. The Robert had, in fact, seen the Cardinal, uh, what was his name? Oh, shoot, I can look up. What one of these is useful. I swear, one of these is useful. Oh, Syriac. The Cardinal Syriac is replaced by the Twelve-Eyed Demon. We still don't know who the Pope is, but we will shortly enough. And... Even in seeing that he embraces the sin and the foolishness of this world over the righteousness of heaven. Delphine finds the Pope, the real Pope, in a wine cask, having been put there by whoever is masquerading as the Pope, the fake Pope. The fake pope masquerading as the real pope. The, de the demon pretending to be the pope put the pope in a, in a barrel of wine. Uh, we are rev it's revealed through a quick flashback that the pope was involved in sexual sin. And that led the way for demons to take his body and to stuff him in the wine barrel. And... That he is, he is now free. Again, another indication of the men being corrupted by demonic influence, by the fleshly world to be taken over and corrupted. Although in this case, I do think it's interesting that they didn't kill him. Because they haven't cared about not killing people before. So just 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 a weird little thing that's like they didn't care about killing anyone, but he, he, okay, don't really understand that. The final battle takes place at the coronation. We get rumor of a monster in the Jewish quarters wreaking havoc. We get the real pope confronting the fake pope. The fake pope calling the fake pope f the fake pope calling the real pope a fake pope and then we also uh, get reintroduced to the lion demon as Tomas rushes to try to take out the pope the fake pope that is he is intercepted by the lion demon dealing damage and injuring the Lion demon, but not being able to reach the Pope. For the Pope retaliates and attacks him, giving the Lion demon a chance to rip Thomas's arm off. It is in this brief flash that we are revealed who the Pope is. The Pope is Beelzebub, Lord of Flies. There have been some references to the idea of him being Lord of Flies earlier but they're kind of hitting you miss and it, it very much feels when you're reading the book as a oh my goodness he's Beelzebub and if you're a fan of the channel you know what I think of about Beelzebub Beelzebub Lord of Flies and Dung mentioned in the Old Testament as the Lord of Akron and is often believed to be the same false god as Baal. Depending on your interpretation, Beelzebub is pronounced Baalzebub, which is aptly probably where they got that. In Thomas's attempt to kill the Pope, he is unsuccessful, his arm is removed, and his body is pierced by an arrow. 
his chest. An arrow that came from a crossbow emblazoned with the Last Supper, carried by a droopy-eyed man. Turns out, the very thing Delphine had said to Thomas all those many, many in book time months ago of the droopy-eyed man killing Thomas because he did not kill him came to fruition. Jacoit, or however you say his name, kills Thomas. And Thomas is finally, finally, oh, okay, I'm being a little sarcastic, but he's finally killed by the very man that he initially saved. Uh, he gets his face ripped off by the tw- well by demon so it's not really a fun time for him and he's probably dead as well we don't get any more mention of him but i'm pretty confident he's dead uh in the ensuing chaos delphine gets impaled by one of the demons hurling a spear at the pope she dies in front of it all uh heroic style jump in front of the bullet take the bullet for you sort of action uh she's then picked up by the It's wait, which one? Which demon? Oh, I'm blanking. Which demon was it that? Which demon is the one that finally kills her? Okay, the twelve eye demon recognizes her as being Christ incarnate reincarnated however you want to call it and pierces her with the spearhead that had pierced jesus's side those hundreds of years before saying you should remember this he then bites off her legs and then throws her aside all three of our characters that we've followed to this point main characters are dead the only one with any sort of preview into the world still alive is robert the story of robert though uh ends within a few pages because he is crushed by a falling cathedral yeah the cathedral just falls on him and he's crushed by Hundreds of thousands of pounds of stone. His fate is not so pleasant in my own purview. Upon his death, we see the monster that had been parading through the Jewish quarters is a behemoth of dead flesh churning, undulating, and picking up dead bodies to add to its amassing carcass to use as limbs, ribs, mouths to consume. But it makes the mistake of picking up Delphine, who is holy, who is, as we just discovered, a reincarnation of Christ. She splits open and angels pour out of her. We get a few angels named at this point. Zephon, Uriel, and St. Michael. Many more pour out, but those three are the ones that are mentioned right here. All of them being angels of immense power in angelology. The only one that I know of to be in the Bible is actually Michael, Archangel. uh, And the other two are in apocryphal books. And they cascade out, fighting against the demons, defeating them. But not in the way you'd expect. As it's described to us a scene of 
two angels grabbing a one of the demons and plunging it into the river and coming back up reborn again as an angel it is said in the story that even redemption for the worst and then we cut to Thomas Thomas is not having so much fun he is in hell in his final moments he hears a voice in his head saying you are ours give up on her you are ours you will not see her again you are ours and he goes through decades of torture and torment some of them being him going through a jury of sorts deciding on whether or not he is damned and him being damned over and over and over again him having to take his skin off pull it behind him and then restitch it onto his body kind of reminds me of this scene from Rick and Morty the skin needs to be fresh and doing horrific things to his friends family and loved ones horrific things to Delphine everything is lost for him and we join him on a representation of the battle of Pressy arrow in tongue and all and it is to our shock and surprise that we see Delphine parading through hell to save Tomas. Tomas does not believe this to be Delphine in real. He believes this to be a figment and a fake made up by the demons as another form of torture. It takes him two full days of her waiting patiently there as the demons and devils try to stop her, but they cannot because of her holiness. Before Tomas finally decides to follow her out, and he awakes in a cart being carried by Delphine. Okay, that whole scene I'm going to get into in a little bit, but let's finish out the book. Because that scene is freaking wild, if you ask me. Oh, re really a stellar standout. Okay, that scene is also probably pretty horrific to, to imagine, like, taking your skin off, dragging it behind you, getting it in, with bristles, rocks, and then putting it and sewing it back on your skin with that all on it. Oh, oh, oh. freaks me out. Ooh, good body horror. Tomas then awakens in the ruins of Avignon, trying to find Delphine. He spends hours, days, helping them rebuild the city, clean up the wreckage from the fight between the angels and devils, never finding her. He does find his broken sword, but he decides to not pick it up again and leave it behind as he leaves the city to continue on his journey he feels lost because he doesn't know where Delphine is he doesn't know have any more purpose because he has been redeemed but also has lost everything so he decides to just go out see what he can do he, it is told to us that he becomes a farmer and through his time, he gains knowledge, experience, and know-how on the craft of farming. And we are told that he makes a group up of four. The final chapter has the four of them go into a barn with a mule and a girl watching them. The girl's father had recently died of plague and the girl thinks that she can trust the four men that entered the barn. 
So she approaches them and asks them for help, bearing her father, and help in giving her some food and so on. They oblige, and they help bury the father the next day, and she continues on with them. The final paragraph is a conversation between the girl and one of the men. She asks him if he has a family, where he's from. The man replies that he's from a town and that he once had a family. If you didn't pick it up already, this is Tomas repeating the cycle that we had started the book with, now reborn as a man in full serenity, full righteousness, having embraced the better things instead of the worst things. He has now turned his life around and is living a upward an upstanding life of honest work compared to the horrors that he had committed those many, many years ago. It is also to say that uh, the girl in the tree that was watching them is a reincarnation of Delphine. What a story. Okay, um, book review over. Time to get into the good stuff. No, I'm joking. It, it, all of this is good stuff. But what I want to talk about now is my thoughts, the story arcs, and some something else about the book that I did not really read into until I had completed it and went back and reread it. See... Another thing I kept from you is the book is split into five parts and each part has a introductory text that tells us the story from the spiritual perspective. In these, we learn of a few different players. Let me, we learn of Lucifer, Uziel, Bieli, Az, Azel, Rahum, Oliet, Bel Figor, Biel Ziba, Azimodia, Astaroth, and Moloch. We learn about Michael, Zephon. Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel. Angels that are fighting against said demons. And the demons who are interfering with the world. Oh, I completely forgot what I just said. So, the book is split into five different parts. Each part gives a look at the heavenly effects. The demons and the angels fighting against each other all the while god is silent I'm gonna talk about that again and in this in this silence the demons feel that they can grab the throats of the angels and win this war and in the case of this war they decide to impact the angels and God by giving humans a deadly plague. We also learn that 
the twelve-eyed demon that has been throughout the entire book is Raum, and the lion-headed the demon is Belphegor. It is also mentioned that through this, the demons release abominations of hell onto earth, indicated by their white hands. Okay, we, we, we get the idea, Jimmy. So, upon first reading, I did not really take too much heed to this, the different parts of that introduced the section of the book. But then, upon second read, I was like, oh my goodness, this explains so much. We get names for the demons that are in the stories that make manifestations, and we get names for some more of the angels and some of the background stuff. See, this world is a world that, up until the final part, God is silent. It is the angels fighting against the demons, and the demons doing their best to wreak havoc on everything. And that is the main point of the part headers, that God is silent, until he isn't. The final part, which is just the main battle, and then... Thomas in hell is accented by simply this and God answered Between Two Fires is a book about a world ravaged by plague filled with men that have been corrupted by demons a world that righteousness does not reign, and a world where those that are righteous suffer greatly. Throughout this book, we see all three of our main characters die. The priest, the knight, and the girl. All three of them are killed. Two of them are reborn. One of them is not. And... But, but in that, it's the idea of rebirth, redemption. See, I've already explained the stuff with Matthew, the priest. But the other main story beat is of Tomas, who has gone from a knight to brigand to roaming man with child and priest to knight again and then finally where he valiantly sacrifices his life to try to kill the pope who is Beelzebub. The way the book represents his story is we get background drops of his brigand days, his days with his wife, his days with the uh well, being a knight, I guess. And we get insights into how he is not fully damned himself. He does not fully submit to being a man forsaken. Uh, if you fully remember, Godfroy was a man that kind of preferred cupcakes and was disrespectful see partly why Tomas killed him was because Godfroy had a habit of doing this to other people and there was a point where Tomas had allowed it to occur and almost a sense of rep recompense he chooses to kill him here to stop it from ever happening again that we see a heart that is willing to sacrifice for the girl is born of this man who is broken. And that is the real thing that I want to talk about with this story is through the 
book, we get the idea of redemption and being able to recover what was lost. But what is the underlying thing is, what is it that allows that to happen? It is not your own choice, your own power. It is the power that comes from Christ. And in this story, Delphine is Christ. It's a little interesting uh, story. So speaking of Christ, Delphine is Christ. Let's talk about that. We get a very real look at how Delphine goes through her arc of being child, having these abilities to talk with angels, having some spiritual abilities to maturing into a woman and then eventually maturing into her full like messianic Christ figure and then ultimately dying, being pierced and split open to allow the emergence of angels. And this is viewed as the uh, that God has answered the angels repeated pleas for him to do something to help his creation here on earth. But this is a story that is very bereft of God. God is mentioned very flippantly. Tomas is constantly cuffing, cussing up a storm and making oaths that would be affronting to most Christians nowadays. And Jesus is name dropped may only a few times, but even in that, it's mostly as profanities. It's not even as reverence. And there's one time that it's said in reverence, and the guy who said it got his face ripped off. Which makes sense when you compare it to scripture. People of <coughs> sin can't. Or, well, demons cannot say his name as he is an affront to them. He can, he can destroy them at any moment, and they don't like that. It is said, the demons believe, and they fear him. Delphine being Christ is a very interesting choice. Uh, I don't fully understand the choice to have a... Christ person be in the story because the when Christ returns in the Bible it is going to be at Revelation and that means the end times are now and the world has come to an end so the idea of her being a Christ surrogate is a little odd I don't I don't mind it especially when this story is very much a embracing of angelology, demonology, the traditions of old, well, I don't want to say old church, but old studies before the reforms. And because of that, I, I enjoy it, but it is a very interesting choice. I, I don't fully grasp it, but I, it, it's, it like sits in a weird spot in my stomach that it's there, but at the same time, a fictitious world has fictitious things. So it's like, yeah, that makes sense. I think the biggest issue I have with it is the fact that it is, in fact, supposed to be, she is, in fact, supposed to be Jesus. But that's no knock against it. I think it's a fantastic story, nonetheless. I think the best part of this story is the redemption of the priest and Tomas. I think the weakest parts are <laughs> Delphine, uh, mainly because I just don't like her. She, she's annoying until she becomes Christ, and then even then she's a... Okay, she's not as annoying, but don't like her. But in saying that those two are my favorite characters, I want to talk about something that is a little disconnected from the book, but I think is connected. See... Tomas and Matthew, great characters. And Delphine is a little weak. You don't really get a feel for who she is, aside from being a Christ proxy. Uh, and everyone else is kind of... Like, there are multiple chapters that occur with a single person, and then they're never mentioned again. And we get a 
sense for Robert and I actually really like Robert's story but Robert is an inverse of his brother both of them being inclined to the homosexual and both of them embracing it to some extent before Matthew ultimately rejects it Robert embraces the pleasure of the world and enjoys the or oh, ordaining that's the word ordaining that the Pope bestows upon him as he becomes a cardinal but the issue I think is that in the book Robert is introduced extremely late I think from a narrative perspective getting the story of Robert drawn out a little bit would have played a much more impactful moment when he eventually decides to embrace the world embrace the deal with the devil I also think the shame of the priest is that we didn't get to see his final moments from his perspective we saw his triumph over the white monk that was in fact a demon but then we see just a few chapters later he's dead and we don't get to look into his head whenever I think of the story I think of where how the world is filled with various stories, adventures, and mysteries. That there is a level that we see and that there is a level that we don't see. Very much how this book has the higher level of the angels and demons and the majority of the story being the human aspect. And I think of how when we look at stories, we can either come away with having a deeper appreciation for life and death, or we can ha come away feeling like we've lost some of our time and that the best characters of the book were killed off before their time. Oh, I'll get to you. But that's a topic for another video, maybe. And also, the way that we look at stories, the way that we perceive the important elements, the way we view good and evil. There is a very interesting idea Idea that has formed in my head of how in the book of Between Two Fires we get the idea that it is good to be disciplined to have control over one's flesh so that they demons the evil powers can't control us we see that time and time again Tomas is tempted the priest is tempted we see Robert tempted. We see the Pope tempted. And we see in half of those cases, people triumph. And in the other half, people succumb. And even in the succumbing, people can rise above it. It's one of those things that I enjoyed about Thomas's story. That he initially was making progress to be rid of the damnation that he sought for himself but that at points he would backslide very much how in real life people don't improve and never deal with the same issue again people have addictions that rear their head over and over and over again making steps in the right direction before falling back to that people can have moments of epiphanies of grandeur and then moments of deepest despair. 
that is one of the most important aspects of the story beyond the higher call of redemption the fact that as humans we can be so far in one direction and then fall back that we can be going the right path before stumbling and falling down the cliff tumbling a few times until we've broken all of our bones and slowly clawing our way back up I want to interject here with some Bible verses as I feel they help embellish and establish the importance of these, especially as we compare this to our real world. Uh, feel free to click off if you're not interested in religion or Jesus. I don't really like religion, but I do believe in Jesus, and I am very proud of my r relationship with him though I am not perfect, and I will continue to struggle with addictions and sins my whole life. Isaiah 44, 22. I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 Galatians 1.4 Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Galatians 2.20 And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for for me. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you, along with all malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from you. I ultimately hope that this video has found you in good spirits, good tidings. Uh, I've been very, very uh, non-active on YouTube and Twitch recently as I said in the intro, and I hope that this video finds you well. I hope that you are, you, you get something from this video. Um, I want to end out here on a few different Bible verses that uh, I feel line up exactly with how the story went. Uh, I don't really... I don't know. Uh, I guess let me know what you think of this video. If you liked it, if you didn't. I don't know. I've been filled with a lot of, I guess it would be anxiety over this one. And even now as I'm recording it, I feel like, did, did I bring it home? Did I bring the essence of the video home? Or is it... Is it just lost? Because ultimately, I think this video, this book, not this video, this book is a great example of a redemption story and the idea of choosing higher purpose over worldly purpose. And I think it's a great introduction to greater themes in literature. Ultimately, I think it could have some improvements, but... I also think the best thing for people to do is read it yourself because I left out quite a bit and I hope that you can find something of use from this video or if you read the book or listen to it again highly recommend the audible but if you don't have the money the author uploaded him reading the book to YouTube 
So I highly recommend you get a chance to read the book. It is, again, filled with violence and graphic gr gratuity. F fair bit of language. Very much fitting the medieval aesthetic. But I pray that this video serves a higher purpose and gives you something to chew on. But until then, Godspeed, God bless, peace. I wanted to hop in here at the end to shout out Brandon, who knows what, and Michael and Trevin and Bold. These are two of my best buds. They both have their own YouTube channels, but it's because of them that I even made this video because they got me into the book and therefore got me invested in the story. So I wanted to give them a quick shout out. Also check them out. Their channels will be linked here. And also, you know, Brian's been calling me out for months and months now and I feel bad. Uh, joke's on you. I don't upload as much. So ha, this is all you're getting. See, they decide to be able to, so to, oh my, oh my, oh my, my brain, I can't figure out.